Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambhutasa Aparuta de sangamata satawara ye suravanta bamunchantu satang. So, this is an uh, important day. The elections. <laughs> Politicians make all kinds of promises and trying to charm us into voting for them. And then the, this evening, we, uh, Wei Zen and Pascal asked for the uh, precepts to go forth as uh, Anagarika. <coughs> so this is, uh, I see this is a movement towards sanity, the other a movement toward madness. We have to admit the world we live in is crazy because it all comes out of ignorance of Ita, not understanding Dhamma, and so we, we can't expect too much from any of the politicians because they don't have any wisdom. And so say the endeavor here for a place like Amravati is to provide a, at least some place on this planet where we can uh, uh, at least have possibility of cultivating, developing wisdom, because this is a great potential for human, for humanity, for human beings, human individuals. <clears throat> of course, too idealistic think that every human being will ever be enlightened and wise. <laughs> but uh, this was this particular teaching of the Buddha was. You know, it's an ancient teaching. It's not kind of modern, uh, new age ideas or philosophies. It's, it's uh, an awakened state uh, of Gautama the Buddha, who lived 2,553 years ago in India and uh, saw the Dhamma, saw the truth, and uh, was able to to develop the skillful means that, that uh, a teaching which has been carried through uh, through the generations to the present moment. So it's, uh, you know, this might look just like some kind of uh, ceremony, but it is, a, it is a, a good sign at a time, pessimistic time where there's so many uh, negative uh, feelings and perceptions generated into the consciousness of everyone around the planet, but they at least this sign of of these two people asking for one year to live the life of the brahmacharya, taking refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha, and then to uh, practice uh, the teaching developing uh, mindfulness and wisdom to be free from all delusion and to see the end of birth and death. So it, it's not just a perfunctory ceremony, but it is uh, always something I find, uh, you know, something quite inspiring to me because uh, one sees the, you know, from my own experience, uh, the uh, opportunities that I was given <coughs> to uh, ordain, to train, and and to live in this form, to where my sole uh, purpose, endeavor, has been to practice in order to see uh, the truth, see the Dhamma. So that's what our goal is, this uh, uh, Amravati, deathless realm, to this name significant enough to 
to remind you of what you're here for, to, to realize, to know Dhamma, deathless reality, uh, for yourself, because, uh, you know, as I use language now and call it Amravati or deathless reality or enlightenment or whatever, <laughs> these are mere words. And, uh, and then so they have their limitations. But they're not an end in themselves. The words are mere kind of signs or pointers. And what are they pointing at? Is that you. Not your, you as a person or a, an individual, but like uh, uh, Lung Po Cha's uh, advice of looking at your mind, looking here, your heart. And then I remember, you know, before I really had any great comprehension of the Thai language, Lung Po Cha took me to a, a fam one of the famous Ajans in the northeast of Thailand, Lung Pu, um, Lung Pu Kao, a very famous uh, disciple of Ajahn Man. And Lung Pu Kao was uh, very old then. This was in, before I came, this was, you know, in 19... 60, 69, I think, somewhere around there. And, uh, and uh, went to his, his, Ajahn Chah took me to, to visit him at his monastery in Udorn province. And so uh, at this time, Lung Pao Chah was uh, as a, as a given a tape recorder. And this was before cassettes and all this, so they had these, these tapes, you know, these... Uh, these large uh, tapes and the Phil Phillips tape recorder and Lung Po Cha really liked gadgets and so he loved uh, to record everything. So we went to these various Ajans in the northeast of Thailand and then Ajahn Cha would get them to say things into his tape recorder. And so they'd carry on discussions and it's in northeast Thailand so it's a uh, where they speak a dialect, the Lao dialect there. <clears throat> and so I couldn't really understand much of what was going on. So I'd just sit there. And uh, when we went to see Lung Pu Kao, uh, Ajahn Chah, uh, well, you know, had, so was trying to tape Lung Pu Kao. And finally, it was time to leave. Lung Pu Kao was uh, sitting in a wheelchair. He couldn't walk anymore. So Ajahn Chah and, and the other monk uh, left and I was getting up and then Lung Pu Kao beckoned to me and said, come closer. So I kind of crawled over to his wheelchair and sat there and, and uh, he said, it's here, it's here. <laughs> in Thai, in the Tao dialect, and I could understand that much. But it was such a strong impression. It was one of the greatest teachings I've ever had because that, that sums it up. You find it all. It's a yutini, yutini, kwam jing yutini. That's like the truth is in here. And that's all one really needs to, to uh, you know, keep reminding yourself. It's not about finding some kind of fantastic reality or truth in an exotic country or some distant place or through any really great efforts. It's just a more of, or more of a continuous uh, reminding oneself to look, to observe, to be the observer. So the two new Anagarikas, they can, you know, this is a point of your year's training is not just to become some kind of Anagarika, you know, and and uh, identify strongly with the conventions, but to live within the structure in order to watch and observe the conditions, the, re the reactions, the emotions, the opinions, the feelings, the likes, the dislikes, the whatever happens to you during this year, uh, the, the uh, encouragement is to observe it, be the observer. So that's what Bhutto, Buddha really means, the word Buddha. 
So it's taking refuge in, in the Buddha, Bhutang Sarnangachami, is another, you know, it's part of our tradition, Pali language and everything, but it also is a, a, an important reminder, taking refuge in awareness, taking refuge in wisdom, in pure presence, not in, you're not taking refuge in any, any person, personality, or anything like that, but in Bhutto, and then the Bhutto is the mantric uh, form of the Buddha's name. So in the Northeast Thailand, uh, uh, Lumpu Man and that, that tradition there, the, uh, this, this mantra was very much, uh, you know, the, the important one. They kept using at first to, to train yourself to move towards, to, to stop the wandering mind with just this two-syllable word, Bhutto, and then, and then eventually uh, you begin to recognize that the, the knowing, the awareness, when you're not just caught endlessly in your emotional problems or your views and opinions or the, the karma that you experience in the present. So what is, what is the Buddha know? He knows the Dhamma, so wake into reality. Now we all have to live within these very mortal forms. And so this is, this is like in a training as an anagarika, you have to, you know, you recognize that it's not to, to identify, uh, uh, you know, your ego with your position or the convention itself, it's merely an expedient means. Uh, making a commitment for one year to live within the, the limits of the eight precepts, the three refuges and the eight precepts. And what for is to be the knowing of what happens, you know, living uh, in a different way than you ordinarily would. When you're a lay person, you, you have much more freedom to do what you want, say what you want, uh, uh, you know, you don't, you don't have the boundaries or uh, the restraints that you, you have now. And that's the point, you know, to, to limit this freedom to just do and say and uh, carry on as we generally would in modern life, modern societies. There's tremendous freedom now, you know, and encouragement. Uh, the modern attitudes of the present age is, uh, is very ba much, very mu much based on an elevation of the ego. It's all about asserting yourself, becoming somebody, proving yourself, may, standing up for yourself, getting your rights, and, and how important the individual is. My rights, my opinion. You can see it just uh, the way that, like at least, these uh, things that, like on internet, the importance of being able to, to let everybody know what you're thinking, putting it on the, on the internet, on websites. <laughs> because, you know, every individual is equally important and has a right to say what they think and let everybody know it. And so the time is one where the ego is, is elevated to a very high level. And, and a strong identity. <clears throat> but in a Sangha life, the ego is, is, is for, you know, to observe it rather than follow it and attach to it and believe in it. So like Anagarika is, is not to, to develop, to reinforce the ego, but to, to help you to give you, to give you that occasion, opportunity, encouragement to observe uh, your ego, your sense of yourself, your personality, sakaya uh, all your fears and desires and loves and hates and prejudices and biases and whatnot, is to be observed. It's not to, we're not to judge it or to to do anything with it, we, if, it's, if it goes against the restraint of the eight precepts, then we don't act on it or speak on it, but we observe it. 
So this, this kind of observing, puto, knowing Dhamma. So the word Dhamma then is, it means reality, the truth of the way it is. And that it's beyond conception. Like we use the word Dhamma, which is another word. And so it has its limitations, but it's not a definition. It's not to be defined and grasped uh, through defining the word, but to awaken, because it's the awakened state that we as mortal creatures can uh, actually recognize with mindfulness. Now that we all have to live within these mortal forms for a lifetime, and so that is, you know, just recognize what that really means. Contemplate your own humanity. What does it really mean to be a human being? Is it you have to live a lifetime within a very sensitive, conscious, individual form. And, uh, and then it's highly conditioned. Once you're born, then you're, you're programmed like a computer, isn't it? You're programmed into identifying, believing, liking, disliking, approving, disapproving, right, wrong, good and bad is all inculcated into us through, through our parents, through our society, culture, education. And this sense of individuality, separateness, identity with the physical body, with the appearance, with its gender, with its age, with its uh, attractiveness or unattractiveness, with its size, with its height, with its color, nationality, ethnic identities or whatever, these become our reality and of course these things are born out of ignorance. They're conditions that we acquire that if we never see through them, if we only operate from our conditioning then we, we experience life always with this sense of fear, anxiety, worry, regret, guilt, and whatnot, the result of this limitation of identifying with mortality, with the physical body, with the conditions, uh, your emotions, your, your views and opinions, your thoughts, memories. So this word mindfulness then, of course, is a, is a very important, uh, it's the kind of essence of it all. It's the, the heart of it is, because even though we can, you know, we have to live within these limitations and in these sensitive mortal bodies, we have this ability to be aware of it. We can reflect on it. So this ability to reflect on the way it is. So that's like Bhutang Sarnangachami, Tamang Sarnangachami. And now Sankang Sarnangachami, you've, you've made a step toward even a formal, conventional for, form of Sangha. Which means those who practice Supatipano those who practice in the right way, the direct way. Now the teaching, at least I try over the many years to make it as direct as possible. <laughs> because like anything, uh, an ancient teaching, and of course the Pali Canon is vast, you know, and you look at it, it's, it's mind-boggling. It's just uh, so many books and uh, to read, and then, uh, so we, you know, it looks like very complicated religion. And then, you know, if you go to Watkins or any place like that in London, look up the Buddhist section, you, you have option paralysis. Which one, when, you know, there's so many books now available with various views, opinions uh, about what Buddha really taught. And then there's different forms, different ways of teaching different uh, conventions. And so that's, and that's not a complaint, it's just pointing out 
then Buddhism as such can look very complicated and complex. But it isn't. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, with this emphasis on mindfulness, it's ultimate simplicity. Because all it really is doing is waking up, paying attention here and now. There's nothing really esoteric or, or arcane or remote or difficult about it. It's just a matter of, of doing it, of being this awakened, conscious, reflective Bhutto in the present. So that's what I encourage you to do this year is to keep your mind because we forget. We, we get carried away with the urgencies, the problems, the personal problems, social problems, sangha problems, difficulties, uh, this nature, this sangsara is like this. It's a problem. It's problematic. It's endless. Arising, ceasing, changing conditions. Uh, and so it's, this is the way, this is what we have to bear with in this birth as a human individual, is, uh, you know, being in a, a sensitive form that is, uh, you know, very emotional, feels everything, and is affected by the impingement that it experiences, both pleasant, unpleasant, neutral impingement. But what I'm doing now is I'm merely pointing it out. It's nothing, it's not to deny it or to judge it, but to recognize this is mindfulness, being mindful. The body's like this. The feelings are like this. Seeing is like this. Hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Pleasure, pleasurable feeling is like this. Painful is like this. Neutral. So it's, it's witnessing. So it's a, it's a, a practice of becoming a voyeur. which has a pejorative meaning in English, but not in French. <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but it means, <laughs> it's a good word, to really um, to be the observer, the, the, one, the, the, the one that stalks and looks and observes, peeks at all the secret things going on in your mind. <laughs> not for titillation, but for liberation. To be free, to, to recognize that that which witnesses is not the condition you're witnessing. Now, the, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's easy enough to understand what I'm talking about, but, but also recognize the power of the conditioning process and the society we live in is, uh, uh, you know, is the, the stress, the pressures, the, the assumptions, the un, you know, the, the lack of wisdom in our society, the lack of being able to discern, the idealism of it, and the, uh, and the, the greed, hatred, delusion, the blame, the praise and blame that goes on. <clears throat> this all comes out of avicca. And avicca is a Pali word for not understanding, not having awakened to the reality, the Dhamma. And then, of course, we're operating, our lives are always uh, being influenced by our habits, by our feelings, by our emotions, by uh, the pressures we have around us the social pressures, affected by the weather, by whether the time of day. This is a, these forms are recognized, are totally sensitive. Now sensitivity then is, is uh, you know, it's, a, it's not, there's no one sensitive state that you can grasp and stay in. Sensitivity is forever changing according to conditions. 
So the planet, you know, is interesting. When, uh, when uh, you know, when I went to Portugal last time, and then this volcano in Iceland, with an old day, you know, we, I wasn't sure whether uh, Jan Panyasar and I were supposed to fly uh, to to Faro on a certain day, but we weren't sure whether we were able to go because uh, all the airports had closed up in Europe. <laughs> And the day before, I mean, we kept trying to check and find out whether Luton Airport, easy jet flight to Faro, and nothing was certain. And so then we, we left here about 4.30 in the morning and drove, you know, Luton's not very far away. <laughs> I've never seen Luton Airport so empty. <laughs> we walked in, usually it's just jam-packed full of people were ready to go to, to uh, various places uh, uh, for holidays. But we got on the plane and it took off at the proper time. We flew from Luton to Faro without any great difficulties. <laughs> but just the feeling, isn't it, that not knowing, the, this, uh, the, the, you know, a, a natural catastrophe, a volcano in Iceland suddenly erupts. And, and this kind of volcanic cloud of dust hovers over, over Europe. And, and then the weather becomes very still, so there's no wind to blow it away. And everybody becomes frustrated, angry, and doesn't know what to do. Uh, because it interrupts our life. And, and then, when, so these are, you know, the experience of stress, not knowing, wanting certainty, feeling inconvenienced, angry, or upset by the fact that, uh, you know, that we might not be able to leave at the designated time. And then the way we can always blame, you know, how can you blame? Blame Iceland? We should sue Iceland for having a volcano. <laughs> I mean, that's how the mind works, isn't it? Let's, we've got to find somebody to blame, somebody we can sue. Or the airline, or whatever. But anyway, uh, Ajahn Panisar and I arrived safely in Sparrow and had very nice time, uh, very good weather. And then uh, coming back, we had another strange experience. <laughs> so we... We were uh, up in, the, north, in the, the city of Coimbra, which is quite far, in, it's right in the middle of Portugal. So we had to drive from there to the airport in Lisbon. And we, there seemed to be plenty of time on the motorway and they were all confident that we'd get there in plenty of time <coughs> to check in with, with no rush. <coughs> but as we got nearer to Lisbon, then suddenly there's a traffic jam. And, it, and this traffic jam seemed endless. You know, it wasn't just momentary, it was forever. That's how it felt. And, and you could feel, I could feel this kind of, you know, the, the driver and the venerable dummy coming, he's using, calling his mother to check at the airport. And, and, and then there was a clock right on the dash of the, uh, of the car, and I kept looking at the time, it was drawing near, departure time. <laughs> and so this is stressful too. Isn't it rushing in a traffic jam, wanting it to, wanting to get through, get there, get to the airport, uh, board the plane, and, and it's not easy anymore. I've got to go through all these security checks. And then it's on easy jet. So it's first come, first serve kind of thing. But we made it just in time. We had to run through the airport. And I'm, you know, at my age, running is not an easy thing to be doing. So I've been exhausted these past few days. And yesterday I went to London. George Sharp invited me, <coughs> took me to a very posh restaurant. We walked all over Holland Park and went to uh, Leighton, Lord Leighton's house in Holland Park, which has been recently renovated and uh, opened. 
and came back totally exhausted last evening. <laughs> and all I want to do now is sleep. <laughs> but the awareness is, this is the point, isn't it? That the body's like this, and, uh, and, and, uh, and then the stress is like this. So, you know, get opportunity sitting in the car, trying to get through, you know, waiting for the traffic to move and looking at the clock on the dashboard and just wondering when, you know, we were going to get there on time. And the way, ability to observe that. You know, so, you know, everything is grist for the mill. Everything that happens to you can be used. <clears throat> because I could observe, having practiced for so many years like this, I could observe it's the stress I could feel, but I could observe it. And that's how I stayed in the puto position of observing. There was no suffering in it. As soon as I kind of gave in to, you know, this, this feeling, I could feel it in the body. But the observing, the, the awareness, mindfulness of this feeling, if I stay with the awareness, there's no suffering. Even though the feeling still does its thing, still operates according to its karma. Now this is discerning, what we call panya, sati panya, to discern. Stress is, is the nature of this realm. This is a stressful realm, having a human body is about stress. It's not because there's anything terribly wrong with you personally, which we tend to take all these things very personally. <laughs> You know, it's because you shouldn't, you should be relaxed and you should take vitamins and give up smoking and things like this. And you should, in order to reduce the stress. But stress is the nature of this realm. This is the dukkha, stress, dukkha, suffering, whatever you want to call it. It's all about, you know, this is the way it is. The body, having a physical body is stressful. You know, when babies are born, they don't come out just relaxed and happy. And full of bliss, they come out, you know, screaming. <laughs> so this is, this is the nature of this realm. This realm is, a, is about dukkha about stress, about change, about old age, sickness and death, about loss, about separation from the love, uh, about having to be with what you don't like. And so, in monastic life, see that this, this form, this tradition is about patience. You know, patience was one of the first things Lung Pa Cha uh, told me I needed to develop because uh, being American, one thing you're never taught in the States, and at least I never heard this, was about being patient. <laughs> and so it's, um, <laughs> and it's like an instant. You want, I want it now, and I want something, and I want it now. I want instant enlightenment. I don't want to waste years of having to be patient. If I can get it, you know, give me a little pill or capsule or something that will make me enlightened right away because I don't want to have to be patient as a Buddhist monk, you know, through 44 years. <laughs> that sounds pretty hopeless. <clears throat> I remember when we were, when I was a student at Berkeley, uh, University of California, and the, and we kept hearing about uh, this LSD. This was, start, this was 1962, I think, and, and uh, the Haight-Ashbury thing was happening. You know, it hadn't retained, uh, it, it hadn't become nationally known yet. But we all knew it was happening on Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco. And this secret 
kind of chemical called LSD. It was whispered, you know, you, you didn't say it out loud. You heard about it, and they said you could get enlightened for five dollars. <laughs> and I thought, well, wow, that's, you know, because here I was, I was doing a master's degree on Indian culture. And so, you know, I'd, I'd go up to this, in the stacks in the library, I had a desk there, look at all these books on, on yogis and sadhus in India, you know, doing the most outrageous things, like uh, hanging upside down from trees or covered in ashes and, and standing on one foot for years. And I thought, if I could just spend five dollars, get a, <laughs> I'd avoid all that misery. Now that's, you know, that's the, that's the culture I'm from, you know, get it instant, instant enlightenment. But also, there's something within me that didn't believe that. I knew that wasn't the case. You know, there, there, there's a part of me that wants, I uh, want something, I want it now. But in, when I went to stay with Lung Pan Cha, then it was patience, tomato. And, and then the monastic life there was all, it was so prescribed, everything had to be done in a certain way. And, and uh, you, you always had to wait and know your place. And, and uh, everything was done in a very definite pattern that you had to surrender to. So, <clears throat> uh, and then, you know, trying to learn another language and, and everything it was very frustrating and brought up a lot of negativity in me. It wasn't anybody's fault, but it was because lack of patience, lack of understanding, lack of wisdom. But also, intuitively, I knew this is what I needed. You know, personally, I didn't want it, but intuitively, I knew this is, this is what I had to do. <laughs> So that's why I'm still a monk. Uh, and of course, Sanjan Chah was right. So even those first, the first year where I was, you know, couldn't understand the, the language very well, and he, and he was very, he gave very long talks, like in the evening, almost every evening, sometimes for five hours, till it was really late, and you're sitting there, feeling. You know, and they wouldn't let you go. You had to stay there. And, uh, and of course, I went through all kinds of emotional reactions to it. But, the, but Ajahn Chah, because of the power of an enlightened mind, when they say something, it, it registers. Something in you, you know, doesn't go around, you know, even though it may be emotional, I, I was you know, angry with him or wanted to get up and run out. I didn't do it because I was practicing patience. And of course, the result was very good. I learned something I real that was very helpful for the rest of my life was patience, patient endurance. So now, at my age, be 76 this year, Patience, being patient is a great asset when you're 76. <laughs> and uh, because you have to be, the body makes you, forces you, whether you like it or not. And of course, training yourself with mindfulness and with these baramis of patience, endurance and so forth, then you're developing uh, in a way that is benefiting you, as an individual, for your life, for the, the, the changing conditions that we all have to have through old age sickness uh, up to death, through uh, the loss of loved ones, through separation, through having to be in situations we don't like, through, all kind of, through being praised or blamed for things. So something like Kwam Jing Yu Tini, Lung Pu Kao, pointing that 
taking it, pointing it right here at his own heart. He wasn't, obviously wasn't saying it's not in him as a person. He was, he was giving me a profound teaching that stuck with me all my, the rest of my monastic life. And he had the wisdom to know I couldn't understand very much of the language, so he made it very simple. But that was enough. Just that. Because whenever life gets complicated, difficult, and, and, uh, and so forth, as it can be, I always remember Kwam Jing Yutini pointing at, Lung Pu Kao pointing at his heart. And that helps to remind me to look there rather than to, to just be uh, whirled around by my feelings or fears or desires. So there's uh, what we call witnessing, observing, mindfulness, non-judgmental. It's not about judging the, the conditions that you're experiencing. Like judgment is always takes the, the, you have to start thinking this is good or this is bad, I like this, don't like this. But observing this pure awareness, pure consciousness, that isn't, it isn't, you know, it's not about thinking, it's not about having concepts or views about anything, it's observing, knowing. And so in this, the simplicity of the teaching, all conditions are impermanent. This is, the, this is the guideline, isn't it? We're not saying all conditions are good or bad or some are good, some are bad and, and, and hang on to the good ones and get rid of the bad ones. It's saying all conditions, the faith, sankara, and icha, all conditions are impermanent. All conditions are all dhamma, sape tama anatta, is non-self. Reality is not a person, it's not mine. It's not me. This observer, this puto, is not Ajahn Sameto, is not a monk or a nun or anything. It is this. Which in you know, from within the limitation of this physical body, is consciousness. And this form, the physical body, is a conscious form. So we have to experience and learn through these conditions, through being aware, awareness, and discerning them. So, so like this is not judging, saying uh, condition, the conditions are good or bad, right or wrong. Or that we, you know, we wish we didn't have any conditions or anything like that. Conditions are like this. This realm is a conditioned realm. This body is a condition. Your feelings are conditions. Your thoughts, your sensory experiences, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, it's all conditions. And conditions are all impermanent. They arise and cease, begin and end, born and die. So that that really sums it up, makes it, you know, the discerning, it's then up to you, discern conditions, whether, you know, they're pleasant or painful, right or wrong, good or bad. And that which observes, that observing, that puto, is not conditioned. So it's beginning to discern the difference, no. This awareness is non-suffering. And, and, and then, then the awareness of the changingness of conditions. And that if I grasp these conditions out of ignorance, then I suffer. I become somebody who, who becomes impatient, wants something I don't have, doesn't want things to be the way they are. So it's as simple as that. If I, 
If I, if I identify, if I, this body is really me, then, uh, then it, you know, it's getting old, and lacks energy, and isn't such a pleasant condition to, to have. <laughs> uh, but it is, but since it's non-self, then it is what it is. Whatever happens to it until death is, is karma, the way it is. And that which is aware is not the body. The body can't be aware that there's awareness of the body. Mindfulness of the body, mindfulness of the feelings, mindfulness of, of the emotions, the four foundations of mindfulness, mindfulness of Dhamma, knowing reality, awaken to the to reality itself so that's that's what i want to encourage you uh, you know to this year that you've determined uh, as anagarikas to really uh, see the opportunity and to and how to use this opportunity in terms of Community life, we, we've, you, you, you're bound into the precepts, and uh, that limits about behavior and speech. And, and so that, that means that gives us something to bounce off of. If we have no, you know, in modern life, especially where there are absolutely no boundaries for behavior, hardly any, any at all, <laughs> it's, you know, do whatever you like. And uh, so, you know, like the, I don't think like etiquette anymore or morality has all that much influence on, you know, the important thing is to succeed, be somebody, assert your rights, express your individuality. <clears throat> but in, in terms of Sangha, our refuge is in Sangha, not in personality. So Sangha then is Supatipano, Ujupatipano, Yaya Patipano, Samiji Patipano. So this is, this is the Pali language, but it, this Patipano means practicing in the right way. One who's doing it. It isn't one just identify I'm a Buddhist and because I believe in Buddhist teaching. It's, it's actually putting it into practice, making it work. So it's not kind of aligning yourself with, on an ego level of I'm a Buddhist, I'm not a Christian or anything like that. It's not to, to, to grasp concepts anymore. So it's Supatipano or the Sankhang Sarnangachami is about Awareness, knowing reality, practicing, doing good, refraining from doing bad. So, in in our uh, way of living within the society, within the sangha, within the uh, the society we're living in, the planet that we live on, it's the aim as an individual human being is to do what is good and refrain from doing what is harmful. But in terms of Dhamma, you know, we have both. We have aspirations to do good and tendencies towards virtue and we have temptations towards their opposite. So the Puto is aware of all conditions as anicca. All the conditions are impermanent. So like this is, uh, uh, you've heard this many times, I'm sure. It's all I've been teaching for 40 years, but uh, it, we do need reminding because the world is so powerful, so real for us. Our delusions are so real for us. Our feelings, our desires are so real that we easily 
believe and, 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 and easily get hooked into them. So see the Sangha life here is, is to put that into perspective. Like I can't ask you to feel any certain way or that you should love the life or that you should, you know, how you should see it. But to, to use this situation for awareness, to discern, to, you know, sometimes you love it, sometimes you hate it, uh, the boredom, fed up with it, absolutely devoted to it, wanting to, to determine your whole life become a summon up for the rest of your life and be some kind of, sometimes we get so inspired we want to do that and sometimes we just want to get out right away, run away. And all kinds of possibilities in between those two extremes. But the encouragement is to be aware of it, it's like this. And to feel, to recognize the feeling of stress is like this or wanting to, loving is really being devoted, or hating or resenting is like this. So the Lung Pu Kao's look, the truth is here, is, is, a, is an offering from uh, an enlightened master who passed away many years ago, but was uh, one of the uh, disciples of Lumpu Man, who I was fortunate enough to meet before he died. And then, of course, Ajahn Chah. This tradition is, uh, is for, is an, an expedient means for liberation. That's what it's here for. So I offer this for your reflection.